Welcome to Ray's Reflection, the Common Man's Bible Study. This is uh, <clears throat> Christmas Eve, and I wish you all a Merry Christmas, and I hope you have a blessed time with your family and friends tomorrow. And for those of you who <clears throat> seem to be alone, remember with God, you're never alone. Um, enjoy the holidays. I am doing a Bible study <clears throat> on this Christmas Eve, and I'll be doing a Bible study on New Year's Eve because some of you told me that uh, you use this as part of your devotion, and, and, that, and that's fine, uh, so I won't break up the continuity. <clears throat> Every Thursday you can, you can have this. We're, today we're still um, pursuing Stephen's sermon or defense to the Sanhedrin after being falsely accused. He has gone through some of the patriarchs and shown the patriarchs <clears throat> that God, when you're dealing with God, you're not dealing with a place. God doesn't need a place in order to correspond with man or to relate to man. And we're now we're going to fast be approaching procedures. In other words, in, in the, <clears throat> the mind of the Sanhedrin, there must be a place and a procedure, and other procedures are the activities involved. And the one who brought the activities is Moses, and that is where we are now. We're going to start in Acts chapter 7, verse 22, knowing that, that uh, Moses, the, the children of Egypt have gone to, to, uh, into Egypt, and Moses obviously has been uh, rescued from uh, being killed or being slaughtered by the Pharaoh's daughter, and she's going to raise him as one of her own. Therefore, it says in verse 22 that Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. In other words, he was a very powerful man in Egypt at that time. <clears throat> and we'll take it from there. And when he was a full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren and the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. Now that's the first act that you see. Moses will become, and you will see this, Moses will become a type of Christ. He will become the type of Christ as a deliverer. In other words, delivering Egypt out of the world or out of bondage. And, and therefore, very much like Christ delivers us out of bondage, bondage to sin. Now, this is the first act of a deliverer. And if, he is type, is, if he's a type of Christ, Christ is the deliverer. He's, he's that type, and he's going to demonstrate it. And this is the first act of that demonstration. It is an act of liberation. And that's what Christ did. Christ liberated us from our sin. And therefore, the first act is the act of liberation. And look at the reaction to it. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood how the God, that God by his hand would have delivered them, but they understood not. In other words, it's not that they did not necessarily know in, in knowledge. They didn't want anything to do with it. They were rejecting him. Now remember what I told you. As he takes each patriarch, there is an element of disobedience, a resistance to God that will show up and culminate itself in verse 51. And he's showing that. It started with Abraham. It, it goes on to the children of Israel as they, uh, the patriarchs, as they sold Joseph into Egypt. And then as the, as the Israelites then went into Egypt, ignoring God's promises and so on. And therefore, now he's here and he literally liberates one of, the, uh, uh, one of his, his brethren from the abuse of the Egyptian was laying on him. And he is rejected. The next day he showed himself to them as they strove. Now, notice you'll say, as they strove. In other words, there were two Egyptians, uh, uh, rather, uh, rather Israelites, who were fighting sort of thing. They were having arguments. They were fighting. And they were, uh, they were, they were battling each other. And here comes Moses. And he would have set them at one again saying. In other words, he, he would have reconciled them. And that is the second act that a deliverer or Jesus Christ did. He not only liberated us, 
but now he reconciles us. The act of reconciliation is here. So the first day Moses liberates the Egyptian from uh, the uh, Israelites from the Egyptian abuse and then he turns around the next day and he tries to reconcile one brother to the other brother and they would not say sir are we brothers why do you wrong one another but he that did his brother wrong thrust him away saying who made thee a ruler and a judge over us wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday in other words here is uh, Moses trying to reconcile the, the uh, Israelite brothers and they reject him. And notice the statement that they say, who may be ruler over us? Isn't that the same thing that was said of Jesus Christ? Who may be to be a ruler over us? And therefore you see the type is, is represented here. Then Moses <coughs> Moses fled at this saying and was a sojourner in the land of Midian. Notice where he went. He went to the Gentiles. And that's basically what Christ did. Offered himself to the Jews. The Jews rejected him and eventually he came to the Gentiles. Where he begat two sons. Now 40 years, not one verse, 40 years has passed. Now Moses is 80 years old. And when 40 years were expired, verse 30, there appeared to him in the wilderness <coughs> of Mount Sinai, an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. Now this angel of the Lord is the Lord pre-incarnate. This is Jesus Christ pre-incarnate. And he appears to Moses. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came on to him, saying, I am the God of, of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now that statement sounds like an identification statement, but it's huge. God is not a God of the dead. He's a God of the living. If you read that statement again, read it knowing that you will see that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob are alive. They are alive. Now see what it says? I am the God of the fathers, the God of Abraham. I am the God of Abraham. He doesn't say, I was the God of Abraham. He said, I am. Therefore, what you were talking about here is we're talking about life after death. Not only does God control the life before death, he is also controls the life after death. And therefore, Moses is dealing with an eternal God. And he's not just dealing with a eternal God. He is dealing with the eternal God. And therefore, because he recognizes that, look what he does. And Moses trembled and dared not behold. In other words, Moses didn't even dare look. <clears throat> and it's not a case of not being able to look. It's a case of being so afraid and terrible that you, you didn't dare look. Then said the Lord unto him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the pl thy place which thou standest is holy ground. He says this, I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their groanings, and I am come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee to Egypt. There are three things here that God said, and he says it today. Look what it is. I have seen. That's the first action. I have seen. That's the omniscience of God or the omnipresence of God. He said, I have heard. In other words, he's, he's heard their cries and their groanings. And he says this, I have come to deliver them. Now, he didn't come to have Moses deliver them. He said, I have come to deliver them. Now, if we get this right, then we can see that all the actions that Moses takes from this point forward are all actions of God. God using Abraham as a tool. And somewhere along the line, the Israelites missed that point. They looked at Moses as if Moses were doing it. And it isn't Moses who delivered the Israelites. And yet, record book after record book, and people will talk, Moses delivered the Israelites out of Egypt. And here it is, clearly stated by God himself, I have come 
to deliver. I am the one who's going to deliver. And if Moses catches that, Moses will have no fear whatsoever. Then he says this, I will send thee into Egypt. And now this Moses whom they refused, now remember, the same one that they refused, saying, Who made thee to be a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and to be a deliverer by the hands of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. And that angel was, of course, Jesus Christ. Now he brought, him, he brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt. Now I have a picture here of the last great thing that Moses did to get the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And that's obviously he did, uh, God dividing the Red Sea and the children of Israel passing on dry ground. And then when the Egyptian army went in after them, etc., that water closed up and drowned up the, army, the army and destroyed uh, Egypt at that time. But if he, he looks at signs and wonders, you will know, if you say signs and wonders, you will see that the, you will... What will be, come to mind will be the ten plagues. But what is not mentioned here is the disobedience. When God said back here, I will send thee into Egypt, we don't get the rest of the conversation here. But it was understood, and the Sanhedrin understood this. Moses turned around and didn't necessarily want to go. He turns around and says, well, I'm not eloquent of speech. I'm not, you know, I can't speak very well. And because of that, God turned around and gave the speaking part when the, the, the conversations that would go to Pharaoh, he gave it to his brother Aaron. And Moses did not speak to Pharaoh. Moses was present, but the speaking part was reserved for Aaron. So the power of the word was taken away from Moses because Moses would not. So immediately you see the, the disobedience, the, the lack of faith part that existed in the fathers. And they upheld them as, as, as heroes. And, and rightly they should. He said this, he says, In the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. Now that 40 years from uh, the Red Sea to 40 years in the wilderness, that includes an awful lot. That includes uh, going on to Mount Sinai, and he will refer to that here where he got to live in oracles, and the, uh, the law and... Uh, the sacrifices and all these things, and then it it takes in the 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 episode at Kadesh Barnea, where they uh, lacked showed a great deal of faith, and that lack of faith caused them to wander in the wilderness for forty years, and uh, that obviously is also uh, a sign of lack of faith, but it, it and it includes all the moaning and all the groaning. Of, of, of the Israelites against Moses and how he had brought them out of Egypt and how he brought them into this wilderness to die and so on. So he, he, he takes him and he tells him, he said, This Moses, verse 40, 37, This is that Moses who said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like me. Him shall you hear. That prophet is Jesus Christ. That's who he is talking about. And he's telling the Israelites that there is coming a day when God will raise up a prophet that is just like Moses. In other words, the aspect of Moses being the deliverer. He will deliver his people from their bondage. Now, obviously the, Israel, the Israelites believed that there would be a prophet. They just didn't believe Jesus was that prophet. And the, the delivering from, uh, like, or the deliverance, like Moses would be very much, uh, you know, out of bondage, out of out of the rule of the Romans, etc. And so, therefore, they misunderstood greatly, greatly, what Jesus Christ was going to be as a prophet. This is He that is in the church in the wilderness, which the angel who spoke to Him in Mount Sinai, and with Thy Father, who received the living oracles, give unto us. So, therefore, what He's saying is this: He says. He says, this same angel, this same one, this same prophet that is coming, that God's going to raise up, he's the same one who gave all the oracles. In other words, he gave the law, he gave the civil laws, he gave the sacrificial laws, how to sacrifice, and so on. So that the Sanhedrin, who were running the temple, according to the quote-unquote law, it would be the law that came down from Mount Sinai. 
And this was given to them by Jesus Christ or by this angel or this prophet that would be raised. And therefore, Joseph, uh, Stephen is saying, look, he raised him. And you guys aren't listening. Whom our fathers would not obey. He says this, he says, but thrust him from them. He says he wouldn't obey them. In other words, if we, if we look uh, clearly, here is Moses with the Ten Commandments. He's been up on the mountain uh, receiving this, communing with God, etc. And while he was up there on the mountain, what were they doing? They were making a calf. They were commi committing idolatry. They were having an orgy. And therefore, when Moses came down, Moses was extremely angry. In other words, you couldn't even wait until I came down. It didn't take long for you to act in a very disobedient manner. And he's looking, Stephen is looking at the Sanhedrin, and basically they're starting to twist and turn because they're starting to see that he is indicting them. And he's saying, pretty much, look what your fathers did and look what you're doing. He said, he said the fathers rebelled, and in their hearts they turned back to Egypt, and that's the calf that they would have worshipped in Egypt. That's what Egypt was worshipping. And now they built themselves a calf to be like that. They brought the Egyptian gods with them. And they said unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. For as far as this Moses who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we know not what is become of him. In other words, they knew what, became, what had become of him. They knew he had gone to the top of Mount Sinai to speak with God. But, they, but that was not enough to hold them to wait until he came down. And they made them a calf in those days, and they offered sacrifice unto the idol, and rejoiced in the work of their own hands. So what did God do? Well, if you look at it, and he does a history here. He does, he does a history, he says, Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. That is, is written in the book of the prophets. O oh, you house of Israel, have you offered to me slain beasts and sacrificed by the space of forty years in the wilderness? Yea, you took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Raphim. Figures which we make to, you made to worship and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Now think about this. He's just taken them almost for 1,500 years or, or, or a 1,000 years or more of history. But during that 1,000 years of history they left the oracles of God they left the worship of God, and they took on Moloch. Moloch was a was a, a foreign god, was 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 an idol, and therefore, and what was amazing was, and I have a picture of it here. This is Moloch, and notice how he is receiving a baby, and literally they would offer their children. They would, had wandered so far away from God in disobedience. They offered their children, and Moloch, and they put their children in the fire. And this occurred in the Valley of Hinnon. And of course, he's, Stephen is not hitting them here with that here, but they're well aware of the history. And in the Valley of Hinnon, during their history, they literally did this. They offered their children to Moloch and by throwing their children alive into the, into the, uh, into the fire of Moloch. And, and the valley is called the Valley of Hinnon, or the Valley of Drums. And the reason they sounded those drums was to sound out the cries of the babies that were being cast into the fire. That's how horrible they had become. And he's looking at them and, and, and basically indict them. And he's saying, these are your fathers. These are the fathers you uphold. Then he says this, And our fathers had the tabernacle in the, of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make him according to the fashion that he had seen. In other words, in other words, he built a tabernacle basically based on what God had told him or how to build it. Which also your father that came after brought it with Joshua into the possession of the nations whom God drove out before the face of the fathers onto the days of David. Now in other words, after the 40 years of traveling in the wilderness, it took 40 years. And if you understand God's judgment, that was a judgment of 40 years. Because they did not believe God at Kadesh Barnea, God said that every person from 20 years up and older would die in the wilderness. It took one generation for that to occur. Now they entered into the promised land. 
from the time the Israelites left the promised land and went into Egypt, and now they are back, it is well over 470, uh, about 480 years. God has given the people of Canaan, the people who resided in Canaan, He has given them 480 years to change, and they have not. They've gotten deeper and deeper and deeper into their depravity. Now he's going to bring Joshua in, and he's going to order them to exterminate these people. Now, we don't understand that, but that is the sovereignty of God. Now, he, said, he says this, he says, Who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for God of Jacob. Now, once they moved into the, into the land of Canaan and started eliminating the people, they were incomplete in their elimination. In some cases, they kept some of the people for slaves. In other cases, they kept the best of what those people had, the best animals, the best, the best of people for slaves and so on. In other words, they were impartial or partially obedient to God's commands. And, and the, the, the nation knew this. And he says this, And they desired to build a tabernacle for God. And David had always wanted to build a temple for God, designed after the temple that was in the wilderness. But he didn't get, because of his disobedience with Bathsheba, he didn't get that, that privilege. That privilege fell to his son Solomon. And Solomon built him this house. Nevertheless, the Most High dwelleth not in the temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. And Stephen is saying this, God does not dwell in temples made with hands. You cannot confide God to a place. This is what he's saying. Nor can you confine him to activities. And he's saying this, I didn't say that. The prophet said this. And here's what the prophet said, quoted, Heaven is my stool, and er <coughs> heaven is my throne, rather, and earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest. Hath not my hand made all these things? In other words, what are you going to make that I haven't already made? Now here's the indictment, and I'm going to stop with this indictment. And he looks at them and says this, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in hearts and ears, you do always resist the Holy Spirit, and here's the cruncher, as your fathers did, so do you. He said, you're just like your dads. If you look at the history of Israel, if you look at the history of Israel, you will see constant, constant resistance to God, even by the ones they hold up to be the highest, even by Abraham, even by Joseph, even by Moses, even by all of the fathers that came after them. And then when you look at the prophets, which of the prophets did they not persecute? You've got the big prophet Isaiah. Wow, what a prophet. And, and the people were upholding Isaiah as a great prophet. Really? You put him in a log and you cut him in half. You sawed him in half. And, and, and Zacharias, you stoned to death. And Jeremiah, poor Jeremiah. It's a wonder he had any skin left after you were done with him. <clears throat> and look what you did with Daniel. And, and it goes on. Every single prophet was resisted by the children of Israel. And when he's looking at them, he's saying, you are no different than your fathers. You're just like them. They were disobedient and they resisted God because they were stiff-necked people and you're doing the exact same thing. And boy, he just locked his sentence because now they knew he was right. And it, it cut them to the quick. I'm going to leave you there. And we are going to end, we're going to end chapter 7 next time with the, obviously that Stephen's going to be killed here, and we're going to end this unit, and then the first, the first Bible study in January, we will start back in the book, the Gospel of John, we'll start with chapter 5, because we did the first four chapters already. We'll start with chapter 5. So I wish you all a Merry Christmas, and uh, I bid you Godspeed from On Victory's Side, We'll see you next week.